21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskarik. I probably spent 10 years of my life at the age of 24. Meaning that for a long period of time in my life, I wanted to pretend that I was 24 so that way people could take me serious in business. You know, I mean, I was 16 running a snow removal company and going door to door selling printing and promotional material. And um, yeah, nobody could tell how young I was. The fact that I was 16, I thought it was one of my disadvantages um, and actually turned out to be my superpower. Um, so I guess a lot of people are insecure about certain things that they think is a weakness, but it's actually their strength. And one of my mentors actually told me the quote that um, your greatest strength lies right next to your deepest wound. So I challenge everybody to just kind of dive deep and try to find that strength, go get uncomfortable, find those sensitivities or areas where you might be a little uncomfortable with. And um, in there, you will find your greatest superpower that you can take and build empires with. I'm Alex Suda. I'm a 27-year-old young entrepreneur out of the Chicagoland area, working on my second eight-figure company currently. I strive to be the best husband, father, leader within the community that I can be. Um, and I also recently launched a book called Restoration Millionaire, so currently can add the title of author to my name. <laughs> the origin story of myself, I, I think I should go back a generation to my parents uh, because they had a wonderful story. So both of them were born and raised in communist Romania at the time. My dad actually came from a village with no running water, very limited electricity. And my mom was a city girl. Um, she grew up in a very communist city mindset. She was supposed to be a doctor or a lawyer, never ended up having to marry the villager. Um, but that's exactly kind of what she did. And the unique story is entrepreneurship has always been through our blood. So my parents, um, on top of just going to college and such, they ended up taking advantage of the fact that the revolution happened. The communist revolution happened in 89 in, in Romania. And all of a sudden foreign items became super popular. So they would drive, uh, they'd actually hop on a bus from Romania to Turkey, and then they'd go to the bazaars and they would find all kinds of clothes um that were turkish clothes that the romanians haven't seen and then they would bring them to romania and sell them there at some point they may, met an american guy who would sell pens that were misprints so imagine like kodak misspelled right and then they would have thousands of those kinds of pens and they had to do something with them so this guy would ship them to romania and then my dad would sell quote unquote american pens to these romanians so it's really cool how they found that dive, you know, that diversification or that new thing. Um, and it worked really well. And ultimately, because of the American guy with pens is how we ended up in the States. So that guy applied for this thing called the immigration lottery or the visa lottery in the States. And it's basically like a lottery where you get to win American papers. And my parents um, basically won that. So. A year later, they packed up everything, started from zero, moved to beautiful Boston. At the time, I was about uh, one and a half. I actually took my first steps on American soil. And um, kind of growing up, my whole life was the typical immigrant child life. Uh, parents were super busy trying to build this empire. Um, they were trying to build this world for their kid, like every immigrant wants and um you know there's a lot of challenges there's pros and cons but i'm very blessed that at the end of the day i grew up within uh, the states a cool quote actually what i think that they strived for was to build the best world possible for their child and that's kind of what every immigrant person wants for their children but actually what they the coolest part of what i think they did with both me and my brother was that they built the best children for the world. 
So that was actually um, a super cool realization that I have right now and uh, a principle that I'm taking and applying to, to grow my kids. One of the things that I learned kind of growing up from my parents and what I admire them for was the fact that they've hit rock bottom, like zero, like ground zero, like negative multiple times in their lives. So my dad came from that village where there was no running water, built himself up, built the businesses in Romania, came to the States, went back to rock bottom. They didn't have anything, built their empire up. And then in 08, they actually ended up losing it yet again for the third time. And then they bounced back up and now they're pretty well off. But a lot of times as entrepreneurs, we get discouraged when our first time hitting rock bottom happens. And then we say, oh, entrepreneurship really isn't for us, right? And um, the one thing that I think I learned from them was the grit and the perseverance. And no matter what happens in life, when you hit rock bottom, it's just an awesome opportunity to, to bounce back up. Growing up in this family of first generation immigrants, as a lot of people could probably relate, we didn't have the a lot of the fa family bonding that typical families have because mom and dad were always working. And seeing them work kind of inspired me from a young age to kind of go on this entrepreneurial journey. And I was also the foreigner with the accent at the time. I was a little overweight. People would make fun of me in school. So I was just like, hey, why don't I just gain this independence? So in high school, ended up starting a snow removal company ended up selling printing and promotional material door to door to uh, certain people. And then eventually my dad and I kind of came up across this idea of starting a damage restoration company. And basically what damage restoration companies do in the States is anytime a property burns down or it floods, um, somebody needs to go there and fix it. And my dad had wanted to do this for quite some time, but he was always afraid of selling and how can he find customers? And I felt at the time that I could sell ice to Eskimos. So it was the perfect partnership. And we started that in like 2013. I was like last year of high school. And uh, we had a lot of success with that. We grew that company over six years to over eight figures of revenue. The camp company still stands there today, 90 or so employees, trucks running around the Chicagoland area. And truly we built a leader within the damage restoration space. And about five years into that journey, we realized that tech within the space was pretty non-existent. There were very limited opportunities like the service titans of the world in our space or the sales forces in our space. So I decided to come up with the idea of Albiware, which is basically a software company that serves the fire water restoration industry. And ended up starting building that with uh, one of my best friends. We ended up getting into Y Combinator, raised about $12 million to date. Um, grew that company and now we have 60 or so employees and the goal of Valbuer is actually to be the first home service or restoration tech company that goes public. So that's kind of the trajectory on that. Um, and then in the meantime, again, my passion resides around restoration, ended up writing this book, Restoration Millionaire. Um, it just launched in January and for anybody that's looking to um, start a restoration business or wants to learn more about a restoration business or just wants to learn about my experiences in business overall, I think it's a great read that you can kind of find on Amazon. One of the big mindset shifts that I realized that became kind of my superpower is the ultimate responsibility of a founder and the CEO is to have a vision that's big enough, a dream that's big enough for other people's dreams to kind of fit within. And I think that's just came naturally to me from a very young age. I remember being, you know, stuck in the room and pretending that I was driving big trucks and doing all kinds of crazy stuff while I was home alone and such. And that eventually evolved into you know, coming up with crazy ideas of, hey, we can have this damage restoration company that can service, you know, thousands of people's homes within the Chicagoland market. And that also then turned into the crazy idea of Albiware of, hey, we're going to take this company that 
nobody else thinks that we could take it public to a publicly traded company where thousands of other people are able to win and create wealth through it. Um, and the more I started reading at, at a certain age, point in time, maybe about four or five years ago, I started reading a lot of self-development books and such. And there's a lot to be said about one visualizing, which was my daydreaming from the past, just thinking about what the future would look like, having a vision for that specific future. And then two, affirming it, affirmations and becoming the person who has those specific things. So I mentioned earlier, like how I was a 24 year old successful person for 10 years of my life. Whether it was lying to people or not, it was almost like me self-affirming that I'm a 24-year-old successful person from the time I was 16. And I was kind of using that to compensate the negativity of my age when I was trying to go sell, you know, at 18, try to sell a half a million dollar fire. I thought nobody would take me seriously. But those self-affirmations and me kind of hypnotizing or tricking my brain into thinking I was going to become successful actually led to me becoming successful. Um, and you see these trends through a lot of famous books. Like if you read Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, just desire and um, affirmations can do wonders. So as an entrepreneur, I think anybody listening to this podcast, whether you're an entrepreneur or not, just remember if, you know, two things. One is your net worth is a direct percentage of the value that you create in the world. And then the second thing is your dream, if you want to have a high net worth or if you want to create massive impact, should be big enough for other people's dreams to fit within it. And if you're able to do those two things, it doesn't matter what the idea is or the market dynamics or the investor dynamics, you should be able to accomplish the craziest things. And if you sit and analyze Jeff Bezos of the world, the Elon Musk's of the world and such, they typically went against the current. They think typically had that super strong conviction over a big idea that could make a lot of people successful if it wins. I live my entire life currently by focusing on going all in 110% in four different areas of life. One of them is obviously wealth, which comes with the business and the success there. The second one's health, my physical body and how it is. My third one is love, which is my relationships with my family, my daughter, you know, friends and so on and so forth. And then my fourth one, spirituality or my relationship with call it God, the greater good, so on and so forth. And, um, before it wasn't really all that way. And I ex experienced this burnout. So starting out in my career, I was focused on just wealth, 16 hour days, run, 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 go all in, didn't really focus on anything else. And it ended up going from like 180 pounds to 260 pounds. So I was a pretty big guy. And then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, I ended up actually catching COVID and ended up in the hospital for about four weeks. And I was at that point where I was like, man, is life really going to keep happening or not? It was, it was not a really fun time at all. And at that point, when I got out of the hospital, I had like blood clots, couldn't walk for a while. Like it was a rough recovery. And I vowed to myself, Hey, I don't care if I lose all my wealth, I need to get my health back in track. So I went 110% into health, went on this whole weight loss journey, you know, focused on building myself back up, followed Andy for 75 hard challenge. And what I realized is when I went 110% on health, I didn't have to take anything away from the wealth. Now, as entrepreneurs, we're told, oh, you can't have it all, go pick one. But you can actually have it all. And the healthier you are, the more you show up in business. So then I did the same thing. When my daughter was born, I focused in on love. I don't want to lack time, just like my parents lack time with me with my daughter. So let me focus on spending time and going all in on that. And that went perfectly well. And then spirituality. And bottom line is, I believe that burnout happens when you focus 110% on one pillar of life and neglect all the other ones. But you can actually have it all and you can go 110% on all of them. And as long as you're going all in on all of them, you won't ever burn out because each and every one of them kind of balance each other out. So I challenge everyone to pretty much be cognizant of that 
And I want to break that self-limiting belief that entrepreneurs have that 16 hour days and hamburgers is the only way to become wealthy. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. A lot of times people ask me related to the subject of social responsibility and some people kind of take it politically and such. I think we all have a wonderful superpower, each and every one of us that we don't really tap into um, in that aspect. And that is our ability to be the lighthouse and inspire the world. And not enough of us do that because imposter syndrome kicks in. So what do I mean by that? If you're successful at a specific thing, let's say you're successful at bike riding or you're a para-athlete or whatever you are, if you're not sharing that with the world because you think it's cocky or you're going to show off, you're actually holding the world back from being inspired by that one thing. So I think the greatest form of helping the world or leaving a ding on, on the entire world is just utilizing your social following, sharing those experiences, not holding that information to yourself and just selflessly giving out into the world. Now, obviously, I also believe in charities and do quite a bit of stuff. I'm actually running the Chicago Marathon um, at the end of this year in October, and I am going to be running it on Team Big Brother, Big Sister of Chicago, and we actually have a fundraiser uh, for that. So if anybody wants to feel so generous and, and donate to the cause, but what I really like about that organization is they pair up mentors with inner city children that probably don't have as many opportunities or probably have some sort of thing that impedes them in life. So they pair up somebody who's maybe a successful entrepreneur or a doctor or a lawyer with somebody who's growing up in a, in a rough childhood or rough household. And there's statistics of like people graduating college, people graduating even high school, people making it. They just increase the chances for these young uh, kids to actually be able to succeed. And to me, like young entrepreneurship, young kids, I mean, they're the future of society. And I, I feel really strong about that. So I don't personally gain anything out of it. Um, other than the joy of helping. So if you guys would like, I can actually, uh, link would be below. So in conclusion, I believe that the reason we exist in this world is to build the best version of ourselves and then share it and pour it back into the world. And like I told you, my version of that is through social media. So I'd love for each and every one of you guys to follow me as I pour a lot of different lessons from the good, bad, and ugly there. And you can follow me on pretty much any social media platform from TikTok, Instagram, Facebook at it's Alex Studa. Um, and yeah, on that social media platform too, if you want to donate to the, to the Chicago Marathon fundraiser, you can also, and if you want to find my book, you can find it there as well. 21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskorik. Imagine a space where triumphs, trials, and tales of entrepreneurship come alive. Welcome to the 21st Century Entrepreneurship Podcast, a gold awarded journey hosted by Martin Piskorik, connecting with listeners in 95 countries and ranking in the top 0.5% of all podcasts. Join our exclusive community, elevate your perspective, and embark on the path to success.